Dear ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to our online panel discussion with the topic uh, parliamentary elections in uh, Croatia. And um, it's a pleasure for me to um, welcome here Mr. Lorenz Jan from the Politische Akademie in Vienna, Department of Think Tanks, um, as well as uh, Nino Preložniak from the Croatian Youth Network uh, and uh, Tena Preletz, um, professor um, for politics and economics um, at the at the, sorry, I got just a second. Uh, well, London School of Economics, and as well uh, as well Zrinka Vrabitz Moises, um, journalist at the Croatian newspaper National. Um, before I will uh, start a short introduction into the into the uh, political situation right now in in Croatia, I will. Uh, Give you the word, Mr. Lan Jan, to um, have some words in advance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. So, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome you today on behalf of the Political Academy, as well as the EDM and the Renner Institute, at this discussion on the parliamentary elections in Croatia. And I also want to send you all warm greetings from our president, uh, Bettina Rausch. As the Political Academy, we focus our work on the countries of Southeastern Europe due to our historical ties and, ge and geographical proximity, regardless of whether we look into the distant past in which we were united by the Habsburg monarchy or into the nearer past when Austria was one of the greatest international advocates of these countries after the collapse of uh, Yugoslavia with uh, Foreign Minister Alice Mock, we have always been close partners in Europe. In order to maintain and strengthen this bond, we must uh, promote exchange and understanding between these countries. And it is therefore important to us that a series of discussions can promote insights into the political events and in the countries of uh, Southeastern Europe, as well as Central Europe and parts of the Black Sea region. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all those involved in this series of events. We have been organizing these talks for some time now and have been able to continue it during the restrictions imposed by the measures against the coronavirus pandemic. Together, we have quickly and flexibly converted the series into an online format that is just as informative and exciting as the normal event was. Besides the fact that three of our countries of interest uh, decided to hold their elections within four weeks. I think that all partners are making a strong contribution here to provide high quality information. Thank you all for that. I'm also particularly pleased that uh, since the beginning of the year, we have been able to offer an election briefing with each event. This briefing provides a good overview of all relevant information on the elections in compact form. With this, we create another great benefit for you. As I said before, the Western Balkans is the main focus of our international work at the Political Academy. We believe that the European Union will not be complete until these six states join the EU. And it is therefore important to us to create a deeper understanding of the region and to provide insights into politics on the ground. I am therefore delighted to be able to invite you warmly to our next joint event on the parliamentary elections in North Macedonia on the 13th of July. Now I wish us all an interesting discussion on the election of Croatia. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Jan, for this um, welcoming words. Um, Yes, and I will um, take over with this short introduction right now for you. Um, Croatia um, joined the trend. Um, Croatia joined the trend for uh, snap elections in the region, and um, it, it is quite probably obvious that um, the the real reason for that was uh, that um, elections should be held. Uh, before an economic crisis in the country caused by the coronavirus pandemic will fully kick in. And the HDZ, the current, uh, current currently um, governing party, decided to have the elections before this crisis can happen so that they maybe will uh, remain in power. So this is why the date of the 5th of July was um, chosen uh, by um, Prime Minister Andrei Plenkovic and his um, and his go government, um, but still the um, the public favor uh, for um, his governing party is um, recently shrinking. 
this is due to many facts. For example, um, it wasn't only the, the corona cri coronavirus pandemic, uh, which um, struck the Croatian state, um, as well as all the other countries in the region, but there was as well, uh, in the same time, a devastating earthquake in uh, which um, caused a lot of damage in the Croatian capital of Zagreb. And um, there's actually a quite big uh, public uh, dissatisfaction with the way this kind of um, catastrophe was handled. And um, some said that they will not forget the bad administration of HDZ and what it caused um, to the city of Zagreb. But there are uh, many other coincidences um, that took place before that, also in political sphere. Uh, Zora Milanovic is the new elected uh, president of the Republic of Croatia. Um, he is um, from the Social Democrat Party and uh, he su succeeded um, uh, Mrs. Kolinda Grabakitarovic, um, who was from the Conservative Party. Uh, she became actually a little bit unpopular in both parts, let's say, in the, in the society of Croatia, um, because on the one hand, uh, she tried internationally to play um, the card of um, a very open uh, person, a very, very fresh leader to the nation of, of Croatia, and um, tried also to satisfy the the need for um, showing up at um, events like in Yad Vashem for the Holocaust um, uh, Memorial in, in Israel. But on the other hand, um, um, members of her staff were sent to, to the town, the Austrian town of Bleiburg, where at the end of Second World War, um, soldiers of the, the fascist Ustasha movement um, were murdered, and which is now for ultra right wing um, people in Croatia a kind of uh, national shrine. Um, still, she disappointed this voter base um, also on the far right, um, who, which actually um, tended more to vote for the HDZ. And this um, is also one cause why, for example, the HDZ is, while it got into this transition under Andrei Plankovic to become a more modern center-right party, um, this um, base, this part of the voter base um, is now, right now, drifting away. And still, the, um, the accession to the European Union did not deliver, actually, um, economically, what the uh, um, Croatian society was expecting. Um, so there was not um, a tremendous rise in the country's GDP. And this is why the young people are voting right now for with their feet, which is actually also a trend in the entire region. Um, so young people take the chance um, with uh, their new acquired visa-free movement in Europe and are leaving the country. For example, mostly to, to Ireland, Germany, Austria and Switzerland. And there are as well other reasons for this um, EU skepticism, because for example, when Croatia, um, before Croatia ascended the European Union, um, Zora Milanovic, who was back then prime minister of the Republic of Croatia, um, decided to settle a political um, issue with Slovenia in a way that did not get him in favor of the public. Um, the, um, the word is about the so-called Ljubljana Bank, Banca Ljubljana, um, which um, actually just closed down in, in the beginning of the Yugoslavian crisis and did not um, pay out all the savings Croatian citizens had uh, at this bank. Um, Zora Milanovic um, decided back then to settle the issue um, by signing a contract with um, Janis, Jan, Jansha back, then, back in, um, back in uh, the early 2000s to um, not further um, pursue um, a possible payback for, uh, for these Croatian citizens. Um, there's also as well the case of the so-called Agrocor, um, which is, um, was a very big um, company um, in um, agriculture and which was struck by um, corruption with the involvement of um, um, President Ivo Sanader. Um, HDZ, who actually got deeply involved in this. Um, Andrei Plenkovich pledged to reform the HDZ, to get rid of corruption, to improve the social standards for the citizens of, of Croatia, but yet 
just little have realized um, of this um, promises. I will show you right now some um, sheets that I prepared to show you the election results from, from I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> mm -hmm. from 2016. So this were the 2016 parliament, parliamentary elections in Croatia results. Um, as you can see, uh, the HDZ got 36% um, percent and got into coalition with MOST. Um, if you're interested here, you see uh, the abbreviations um, below this. Um, below this graphic, um, which party um, for what the aberration stands for. Um, so HDZ is the conservative center-right uh, uh, party um, uh, connected to the to the European People's Party. Um, then you have Croatia Grows. Actually, it's a co it was a coalition, or it still is a coalition, just has another name, um, which is led by the Social Democrat Party of Croatia and is um, central left. Um, this small party uh, with 9%, um, or rather small party, um, MOST, um, which translates into bridge, is actually central, center right liberal. Um, and was um, in the end the kingmaker. So there were um, coalition talks between Croatia Gross and MOST, but MOST did not get into an agreement um, with uh, Croatia Gross and decided to join forces with uh, the HDZ. So this is the polling for right now. The source is Promotia Plus, um, as you can see um, on the right corner. There are many other uh, um, uh, predictions, um, but actually they are very similar in the outcome. So you have um, uh, the Restart Coalition, just as uh, Croatia grows right now is called, um, seems to have, seems to be um, able to get the biggest share in uh, voter a favor, but the situation gets just more uh, difficult, as you can see, because right now most will not be able to probably to to get over the five percent uh, threshold to enter the Croatian Parliament, the Sabor. But uh, a new party, the Dipa um, um, the so-called Domovinski Pokret or Homeland uh, Movement, uh, a far-right party um, consisting of members of the HDZ were pretty nationalist, but decided after the reforms of Andrei Plenković to leave the party and form their own bloc, um, it would most probably be able to get um, almost 14% of voter share, which is um, a very, very uh, interesting, but also frightening situation, because this would mean that HDZ can actually stay in the government when they get into a coalition with this um, homeland movement. So, and right now, um, I thank you very much. And um, I will give the word first to Ms. Uh, Tena Prelets from the London School of Economics to tell us, um, uh, to give us a more deeper insight into, into the current um, socioeconomic and political situation in Croatia. Um, thank you very much, you all, for joining us. and. Let's have um, a very fruitful discussion. So, please, Tena. Thank you very much, Lucas, for this, uh, for setting out the scene and for this uh, lovely introduction. Uh, for correctness sake, I need to point out that I'm not a professor yet. I'm just a humble third fellow at the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford. And I'm also an associate of the research unit on the Balkan Soviet Union. Uh, can you hear me okay? Because I can see uh, the sound coming back. Is it fine? Um, yeah, it's a little bit interrupting, probably. Okay, let's try again. Is it better? Uh, uh, again now? Is that yeah, better? Yes, Excellent. that is better. Okay. Yeah. We cracked it. All right, <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I will. Um, uh, I will 
talk about a, a, something that I see as a trend in Croatian politics, mm -hmm. uh, also beyond this, uh, this election here. And this trend that I see um, in specifically in electoral politics in, in Croatia is that uh, is this attempt and failure at the same uh, time to get out of the mainstream. Meaning mm -hmm. that uh, um, I think we can notice from the voting patterns that voters have been trying to get out of uh, a binary choice of two mainstream parties, the Hadeza and the SDP, for quite a long while. And yet, uh, again and again, it seems that the mainstream has managed to capture voters once again at the end, you know, in the electoral coalitions, etc., etc. So I'll talk a bit about that, and I'll talk also uh, about why this time it might be slightly different and what that might mean. Um, so, as I said, you know, um, in several elections, also as uh, um, from, from the graph that you showed for the 2016 elections, uh, you can see that there was always like a third stronger contender. And um, uh, apparently, like uh, at first sight, you know, if you check who the strongest contender was, um, it was all over the place ideologically. Like, for instance, at a certain point, there was ORAC, which is a Green Party at the European Parliament elections in 2014 that gained a lot of votes. There was, uh, you know, most. And in some ways, you know, the success of other parties like um, or, or figures like Skoro coming as third contender or or GVZ at a certain point, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it can be noticed. Um, uh, it can sort of be explained uh, in this uh, um, framework that really Croatian voters are trying to find somebody else to vote for aside from HDZ and the SDP. So, what are the reasons for this, and how may it be playing out uh, this time? So, um, first of all, I think it's clear that uh, people, by and large, in Croatia do not really feel represented by politics. And this is clear, for instance, by the turnout, which is uh, consistently low at, uh, at elections in Croatia. Uh, last time it was just about 50%. Let's see how it will be this time, because also this is a key issue in terms of the legitimacy of the elections, of course. And of course, you know, the problems with coronavirus uh, makes it more complicated because, uh, uh, I mean, it seems that it will not be compulsory to wear masks, but how can you ensure the safety of people to go to the polls without masks? So all this, you know, actually complicates matters but in any case you know the turnout has been consistently low so this tells us something um, and also, uh, I mean, uh, another another point that I would bring in here is uh, uh, the diaspora, the emigration. So as uh, Lucas mentioned, uh, this is definitely also linked to a certain extent to economic opportunities, meaning that people have uh, been making use of the freedom of movement to go out of Croatia and move towards uh, uh, to other Western European countries uh, mostly. But aside from economic reasons, actually, um, uh, research studies have showed again and again that the number one reason for people to leave is really that they do not feel like there is a meritocratic system at home. They do not feel like they can, you know, make their way in Croatian society um, uh, in, in, in a way that is fair and without pulling any strings. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll tell an anecdote here, and it's that uh, um, also I mean this is linked with the way the diaspora votes to some extent. The, uh, the diaspora has been um, uh, looked as uh, uh, the Croatian diaspora usually votes uh, for the right wing, and it has been uh, uh, perceived as as uh, as linked to that uh, to that option specifically. And I try to motivate uh, Croatian citizens living. Uh, in the UK, wait, let me. Okay, can you hear me well again? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Because I thought there was a there was a problem again. Uh, so basically, I mean, um, it is to to this extent, you know, this uh, um, this conception of the diaspora being very linked to the right wing makes it so that the new diaspora voters, so uh, people who have been leaving the country recently, not only for economic reasons but also because they don't feel any more so represented by the dominant, you know, quite uh, right-wing, stale, conservative and clientelistic, um, uh, really, uh, trends in, in Croatian society that they see, they do not feel so represented and they actively do not want to vote. So I've been attacked for, for telling people, look, these are the ways by which you can ensure that your voice is heard from the diaspora in Croatia. And they said, I don't want to participate in this, you know, corrupt way of voting because the diaspora is something that does not represent me. So you can see that basically, uh, at the end of the day, the reason why people are, you know, 
so kind of disillusioned with Croatian politics. It's partially ideological, um, but also most of all, I think it's linked with this perception of uh, clientelism and the lack of uh, uh, meritocracy. Mm -hmm. So now coming back to this uh, specific to this uh, election, um, I think it's fair to uh, to remind that uh, the Hadeze, at least outwardly, it has been moving closer to a moderate uh, axis on some ideological values. And this has taken the steam uh, out of uh, the SDPs uh, um, uh, of the of the SDP uh, to a certain extent. And yet, the Restart Coalition, which is led by the SDP, is now faring first in the polls. I would uh, I would say that this is most of all uh, because of the Hadeze's failure in certain respects. So, since the announcement at the of the of the elections, they have done quite a lot of uh, pofa of uh, of mistakes. So first of all, the coronavirus response, it has started with a bang. So they have managed to quite successfully, I would say, um, stem the, the infection at the beginning. But uh, uh, several mistakes have been done at a later stage. Uh, so for instance, this tennis tournament in Zadar has been very much in the news. But in any case, it's incontrovertible that uh, the levels of uh, the infection are going up. And, uh, and this is a problem. Uh, so the be I think this is the best indicator actually of the Hadeze's popularity. The fact that when you ask people in polls if they agree with the direction the country is going towards, there has been an unprecedented surge uh, uh, of about like uh, people supporting the country's direction have been gone uh, further than 50% at a certain point at the beginning of the coronavirus crisis because they thought it was managed effectively. But now it has, ref it has reached the levels before the crisis. So it has gone down again to about uh -huh. uh, 20%. Other mistakes they've done, I think that Plankovic has actually not learned anything from the way he won against Milanovic in 2016, because Milanovic in 2016, uh, who was the leader of the SDP back then, uh, was very arrogant and very top-down, like sort of uh, over over Plankovic. And basically, from the latest uh, uh, duel between uh, uh, Plankovic and the leader of uh, the SDP, um, uh, uh, we can see Bernadic, we can see that uh, he's been uh, using a similar type of approach. Uh, so uh, there have been other other types of uh, uh, of mistakes, but I want to, uh, uh, we can we can discuss about that later on. You have also man mentioned the very important issue of the of the mismanagement of the reconstruction of Zagreb after the earthquake. Uh, but in any case, you know, um, I, I would say that uh, the reason why the mainstream is still strong and quite clearly, you know, the two uh, bigger parties will still be so after the elections, the Hades and SDP, is that of course they have this institutional advantage. But on the other hand, as you've noticed, uh, as you've uh, showed us late earlier, um, we see this surge on the right of uh, Skor and his coalition. Now, what I would say here uh, that is important to point out is that I do not believe that uh, the coalition led by Miroslav Skoro is uh, um, uh, that their main um, target is creating a right, strong right wing party but rather that it's taking over the Hadeze and bringing it back to a far right uh, type of, uh, far further right type of party. So we can discuss that later. Whereas on the left, we have some smaller parties, but I would say that some of them have managed to capture the zeitgeist of some of these grievances that I was mentioning earlier. So it will be interesting to see how far these, uh, these new parties will, will reach uh, at these elections. So as a net result, uh, I think uh, the, you know, the Croatian electorate is still looking for a way out of this bipolarism, uh, for a third, a fourth, fifth way out. It's not totally there, but it's sort of going there. And uh, um, I do think that, you know, uh, that basically the main uh, result of this election will be that the real battle will be after the elections, yeah. when, when we will see how, you know, how everything will, um, will turn out in terms of the coalition. And that this might uh, open up opportunities also for new experiments uh, for the first time ever, uh, except for a small, uh, maybe 1991 experiment. There is actually the possibility that the option of the Grand Coalition uh, might also be taken into consideration. So this will be interesting. And I'll finish just with two uh, elements, one which I found, find very dispiriting and one which I find encouraging of these elections. Uh, the dispiriting or rather the disgraceful thing is the, um, is the topic of uh, 
women's rights and women's body really uh -huh, being uh -huh. used and abused during this uh, uh, this this election. Uh, I mean, honestly, I find it uh, uh, something that is completely out of place uh, in in 2020, and uh, and something that uh, some parties, you know, including Toro and Most which is very much not a centrist party anymore, by the way, but it's very much a right-wing party ideologically, have been trying to look for easy topics to manipulate uh, the, the electorate. And I do hope that this will not play out well for them because really it is very disgraceful. On the other hand, the encouraging thing that I would like to highlight is that um, for the first time ever, I think, we can see that some individuals who have long stood at the margins have had the courage to kind of stand up and to say no. We are not going anywhere. We are actually taking action and we are now going to, you know, be actors in Croatian politics and not just passive spectators. And I find this very important because uh, it goes against this uh, uh, widespread perception, as I mentioned earlier, of politics as a dirty thing for Croatians, of uh, politics as something that is only, you know, um, something that is that you wouldn't touch with the barge pole. Um, so this will be marginal. Uh, I do think you know such options uh, will be marginal at these elections. But I do hope that this uh, approach and this attitude will stick around and that we'll see more of it in the future. Oh. I will stop here now. <laughs> no problem. Um, thank you very much for these words. I just have um, something to add for the for our dear audience. Um, you are free to ask questions, um, and we will, of course, um, addressing them later on. So feel free to write anything in the chat, and we will um, select um, your questions. So this was very enlightening. Um, and I want to ask you, um, Zrinka, um, what do you perceive, um, for example, from the um, from view of a journalist, from a free media journalist? Um, how's, the, how's the mood? How is the um actually right now situation in the sit in the society what kind of what kind of uh, um changes had there been or um is everything still the old and the same uh, sorry you have to activate your your microphone all right Oh, Does yeah. it work now? Yeah. yeah okay. Yes, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tana, for her introduction. Uh, I wouldn't agree with some of the things. This was a very general picture. First of all, uh, I would say that HDZ never became, well, they were pretending that they were becoming uh, uh, a normal, civilized, uh, conservative party, but their actual electorate is very far right. And this is the reason why they are so disappointing disappointed and why they're afraid that actually their own electorate would give their votes to this homeland movement, the the right the right wing movement led by a singer and a showman. This is a trend in Europe. The other thing which is the most important is that actually this absolute abuse of Corona situation uh, and of course, I mean, it, it was the idea of the prime minister. He wanted to abuse high ratings that he had in April at the, at the beginning of May, because of course people were frightened, they believed in institutions and blah, blah. Uh, actually can probably uh, hit back into his head as a boomerang. Because uh, in the meantime, many other things happened and people are realizing that th there only idea is to prevent uh, uh, actually a, a, a high turnout. What we know now is that turnout would be very low, that people, for example, from uh, uh, old people's homes, socials inst social institutions would not be able to vote. On the other hand, they suddenly opened borders with Herzegovina for so-called diaspora. We know that they are not diaspora. They are one of the constitutional nations in, the, in, in other states. So it's crazy that those people can vote in both countries, but never mind. And also what Tena did not mention were those actually to, to um, how, how to explain those five years of governing of uh, uh, Andrei Plenković, who's one of the favorite members of so-called young members of European People's Party is corruption 
and hypocrisy on one hand. And although these affairs were of course discovered by independent media and they were latest to affairs which probably influenced uh, lower ratings of his own party. The one is scandal about wind farm affair in which one of high ranking politicians, uh, Josip Arimas, who was also mayor of Knin and of course member of the ruling party, uh, participated and she's in prison right now. And the other one is Ina. So as you know, uh, Andrei Plenkovich has very close connections to Orban and his uh, right wing and populist party. And uh, what, what we realized and what Nacional discover, discovered that the Minister of Environment, Tomislav Chorich, who was actually consignatory of the memorandum with Mol, directing Croatian oil to refer, refineries in Hungary and Slovakia. Oh, so he was working against uh, Croatian national interest. And you didn't mention a new green left central party, which has, according to the polls, I hope lots of chances to win at least two or three seats in the parliament. This is Mojemo. We can. And they're very strong in the capital and in some other urban areas in Croatia. And there are there are the third option, this moment, not Zid, not the shield. They are the third option for those who are disappointed with social democrats, for those who we don't have a real liberal uh, civil party. We don't have it anymore because liberals, unfortunately, sold their souls to, to, to HDZ. But now we have Mojema. They're very strong in Zagreb, and well, when we look at the polls, we can see that actually restart coalition led by social democrats, they are leading now. What they mm -hmm. lack is their so-called coalition potential. But if Mojema, which is the new green uh, left party, and you also forgot about national minorities, mm -hmm. they have eight seats in the parliament, and they usually go with the winner. So they, of course, they, they protect the, the interest of minorities in Croatia. They go with the winner. And if some other small parties win at least one or two seats, probably, probably we can prevent this huge coalition with far right. And this would be a real disaster for Croatia to have HDZ as so-called central democratian party and the far right party in in a great coalition this would be complete disaster worse than than corona crisis economic crisis whatever which may expect croatia and the other thing which was not mentioned is this hypocrisy regarding historical revisionism so we are playing with our fascist history uh uh you mentioned Kalinda Graber Kitarovic, but this is exactly what the Prime Minister does. When he is in Europe, he's anti fascist. When he comes back home, he is, uh, you know, he's not reacting to the legalization of Ustasha fascist salute, which is similar to Zig Heil in Germany, Zadom Spremni. Uh, even our judiciary is legalizing that salute. And the ruling party is not reacting to complete fascization, neo-fascization of Croatian society. And maybe the most important thing, they were abusing Croatian so-called public television in their campaign. And none of the parties was mentioning media. Media were abused by the ruling party. It's not the topic. It used to be the topic in the 90s. We claim that situation with independent media is worse than it was in the 90s. So there are few topics which were not touched, but there is still hope that this so-called silent majority who never turns out will probably turn out as they did for presidential elections. Nobody expected Zoran Milanovic to win. He won despite the polls. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Yeah, as, as we see, this is a very, very similar trend uh, when it comes, for example, to media um, with um, also with Serbia, where Serbia. the word is of um, yeah. Medis, Medis Mrak, which translates into medial darkness. 
Yeah, and um, always um, public um, public stations are uh, mostly becoming a voice of um, yeah, yeah. of Political propaganda weapon. for the ruling party. Yeah. yeah, yeah, political weapon, and you know they show not only in the new news programs. There are suddenly mm. ministers are in entertaining programs, magazines. Ev I mean, we wrote a text about that. It's a huge percentage of media time abused by the ruling party before the campaign started. So they were very clever. Now they're not abusing it anymore that way because it's campaign. It would be so obvious. But before the campaign, when they knew that they would have early elections, they started to abuse it enormously. And I'm surprised that none of the oppositional parties ever mentioned that. They're not talking about that, which is a disappointment for us, of course. Of course. So, um... I uh, would like to, to ask uh, Nino Preloznyak. Um, nice speaker as well. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 no problem. Um, this is an open discussion we have. <laughs> um, um, Nino, um, because you're actually working, you're the vice president of the Croatian Youth ne Network. Um, um, can you give us some, like, for example, an insight on um, how um, the, the, how is the, um, the situation with the with the young people in Croatia, with the well-educated one, with the lesser-educated one, um, what is their opinion um, on politics in the countries, and um, can there something be done to 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 let's say a uh, um, little bit diminish this trend of uh, um, brain drain in Croatia? Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me here to be in this panel discussion. Uh, so first of all, I'll just um, uh, give you a brief overview of uh, what we have done uh, regarding the, the pre-election, um, uh, this pre-election campaign uh, and uh, political parties and, and coalitions uh, and if they are uh, tackling the issues of young people or not. So actually what is what is happening that uh, we have really a decreasing number of young, young people who are participating in any kind of uh, uh, form of, uh, of, of democracy uh, processes, for example, also here in election, because uh, their needs are not heard. So they are not heard well. Uh, political parties in their programs are not tackling, like they don't have concrete measures or some kind of guidelines that will answer on their needs. Uh, and we can see, for example, uh, we don't have uh, measurement uh, about how many young people were participating in, in the last parliamentary elections in Croatia because uh, our, uh, our institution is, uh, is not uh, doing this, but actually uh, in the European parliamentary elections, we have just, I think, 18% of young people who participated. One of the reasons is that uh, they are not attached to, to the European Union still, because we are like uh, a young member of the European Union. But actually, uh, the topics that are, that are uh, covered during the, the campaigns and actually in their programs, are not tackling the issues of, of young people. So here we are talking about uh, priorities for young people here, uh, housing for young people, uh, quality employment. Uh, uh, so we also have uh, ecological topics that are not tackling in, in their uh, programs. Uh, so we are still uh, talking about uh, Ustasha uh, context, about history. And we, uh, when we are talking about young generations, they cannot uh, identify themselves with uh, with those kind of topics because they were not part of that. So um, I can say that uh, there are some group of young people regarding also the, the education. For example, uh, we can see uh, the trends that uh, high educated young people uh, will give the votes uh, to, to some uh, left, center-left uh, uh, parties or coalitions. And uh, for example, uh, those with, with high schools will mostly uh, give, the, give the votes to, for example, uh, center-right or center coalition, something like that. So, yeah. But can you just say, uh, actually repeat the questions once, once again? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, the, the, the question was actually, um, is there also like a political possibility? Uh, is there a possibility to, to change politics to be more in favor for young people and to give them an incentive to stay in Croatia? What should be done in this in this direction? 
Yeah, research shows, for example, uh, in 2019, uh, there, there was a really uh, comprehensive research uh, done by uh, Friedrich Hevesh uh, Stiftung together with the Institute for Social Research uh, and um, really quality uh, researchers. And um, there are some of elements that can bring like uh, uh, quality participation of young people in democracy processes. First of all, we need to have like uh, uh, a civic education uh, in schools that will be like really, really uh, formal as a, as, as a subject, not just as a uh, as a side subject in the, in the school. Uh, we need like also uh, quality youth centers that will be like the spaces for you to express uh, themselves to 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 let's say practice uh, democracy processes. For example, to have panel discussions uh, to to develop critical thinking, so it is also part of civic education. Uh, but also uh, programs and topics, topics needs needs to give, need to give answers on uh, on their needs. So nobody actually ask or make uh, or make research like what are the actual needs of young people, or just take, for example, uh, existing research and the results of this research and just to just just to put it in their programs or give the answers on 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 these results. So. Yeah, there are quite a few elements uh, that can bring the um, more more uh, political participation of young people also also in Croatia. Um, also, here we can talk about um, a really huge migration of young people uh, while entering the uh, European Union. So from 2013, uh, because uh, I think that system that that we are living in uh, was not also like. It was, it was not quality also for, for young people uh, because we have also high rate of youth unemployment. That was also one element why young people um, left the country uh, starting from 2013. And also we have absence of uh, a structural education uh, reform. So, yeah, this is it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, we have our first question for a public question. Um, which is rather long, um, and I would like to concentrate only um, on the, the Is last it the one part. that we can see on the screen? Yeah, I will know. just um, okay, show yeah. it to uh, the whole audience. Uh -huh. just, um, okay. Uh -huh. so because it's rather long, I would... Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm reading it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, so about big coalition, yeah, probably, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, if I can say no. something, I mean, most already betrayed, mm -hmm. betrayed, <laughs> betrayed their partners twice. <laughs> so I don't think that, uh, yeah, they can get some seats, but people mm -hmm. do not trust them. They they, they started as um, central right well independent party but now they prove to be very conservative and actually actually very very right party but nobody trusts them so yeah i think that this uh, homeland movement will get most seats in slavonia and when look when and i'm sure that tena has this analysis if you look at the electorate then eastern and southern parts of croatia with less educated people vote for those right-wing parties, which is obvious. Uh, urban parts, Southwest, uh, uh, Istria, uh, the, the most developed parts usually vote for left or central left parties or regional, and we did not mention this regional, IDES, Istrian Democratic Party, which is yeah. actually regional but left party. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, yeah. I still think that there is no chance to have a big coalition between Social Democrats and HDZ because this would completely destroy Social Democrats. They're mm -hmm. aware of that, uh, aware of that fact. If they want to prevent um, fascization of Croatia, probably yes. But then we'll before that we'll have to repeat the elections. But something I would like to add about corruption. And this was, um, I think this is something that also worked against the, the ruling party. It's not that just that 11 ministers had to leave the government because they were accused 
for corruption, and the prime minister get rid of them only at the moment when he himself was endangered by public opinion. But also their coalition with a corrupted mayor of Zagreb. So the, the guy rules uh, for the last 20 years. There is a number of processes against him. And actually, you know, all, the, all those processes were either postponed, never ended, or were stopped because somebody always needs his hands in the parliament. He started with one seat in the parliament. He ended with 12 seats, which means that he bought, it was a political trade, 11 members of the parliament. And this is the reason why people, not just young people, are so disappointed with the politics. They voted for something, and like, as you know, it's, it's uh, HNS, uh, they, changed the signs. they changed signs in the middle of, of uh, when, when Blankovic needed some, some more, more seats. So, you know, this is the reason why people are disappointed. And this is the reason why electorate, HDZ and SDP electorate is old. Young people don't want to vote, including my daughter, who is my fourth child, who is 18 now. She doesn't want to vote. It's her first time that she can vote. She doesn't want to because she doesn't see the purpose of it. And I'm sure that um, there are younger people here who can explain that. Of course. Yeah, I can agree. This is like partly true. But actually, uh, what we also observed is that uh, there are like uh, new ways of uh, making the impact, you know, like for example, for example, generation uh, uh, um, Y and uh, Z. So there are actually millennials who really want to make some impact on their society. And uh, when we are talking about this kind of system, electoral system, it's like really conventional one and it's really formal one and with non-formal ways of making the impact, for example, uh, petitions. So. Uh, some kind of protests, uh, online campaigning and something like that is like, um, for example, I think 60 something percent of young people really want to participate in, in this kind of uh, democracy processes uh, because they can make the impact here. They, they don't have like the, the representative, like what, what you also said. Uh, but actually now I think that in Croatia, uh, we are getting some kind of, uh, uh, for example, potential electoral representative, representatives uh, of young people who are actually tackling uh, their issues. And I can say that uh, a coalition module, what you, what you also actually mentioned, uh, that is uh, green left uh, coalition. Yes. Yeah, and when we analyzed uh, their program and compare it to, to the other programs, they have like, I think the concrete measures or let's say guidelines uh, to solve their problems. Yes. Also, uh, uh, how to tackle new time unemployment, how to tackle uh, precarious work, uh, like how to tackle uh, housing for, for young people, or also mentioning youth work, like what other parties are not mentioning and that, that yes. is really like spread among the Euro Europe. So, and this is like how you can get young people like uh, with concrete topics that are really, uh, that, that they really matter to. So yeah, this is like just some kind of addition to your- But they don't uh, have the money to campaign. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. The problem. so they, they, can, they, they can only like, campaign on, 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 net, on networks and things, but they don't have yeah. the money for televisions. And now yeah. because of Corona crisis, they cannot go around Croatia and meet the people like our prime minister, who is supposed to be in self isolation. This was one of the topic. He refused to do whatever, everything else has to do because he was in touch with Djokovic uh, and Goran Ivanishevic who were uh, corona positive yeah. and he doesn't he, want to go into self isolation but he actually and, showed know, he, I don't he know do whatever sorry. other people can sorry yeah no sorry problem yeah no but, problem please but, you know <laughs> yeah yeah but i don't know if you if you're watching in monday or sunday uh, mm -hmm. Uh, that was like uh, at the duel in on television. Yeah. So yeah. he actually showed that he made uh, the test uh, coronavirus yes. that, that oh. it was like negative, you know. But yeah, he should be in self isolation. Yeah, tennis. Of course, <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So a number of things uh, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, prospects for Grand Coalition. It's very true that until now this was a no go for the two mm -hmm. parties and especially for the SDP because. Uh, um, you know, so as I mentioned earlier, 
if they're seen by most of the people as being two parts of the same coin, you know, the Hades, SDP, et cetera, et cetera, going together would sort of prove this prejudice and uh, and it would uh, detract even more voters from that. So until now, it was a no-go. I wouldn't be so sure that this time there won't be, it won't be considered. I think, you know, it, it might for the first time actually come under consideration. Let's see. Uh, about the uh, most expelled from the government, I mean, that was uh, the last time was in 2017 over the agriculture crisis, and it was a very mm -hmm. rude move by Plankovic in which uh, basically he got rid of the of most and got in a part of uh, HNS, which split in that moment. So it was this moment, I think it was sort of a also Faustian moment in which we saw Plankovic, you know, uh, coming out of this uh, uh, gray Eurocrat suit and uh, as somebody being decisive in the wrong moment. Yeah. Sorry, what? Yeah. Being decisive for the first time, but in the wrong moment. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, at least, you know, until then, you, you had this, uh, he, he could maintain this uh, superficial outward uh, impression yeah. of the bureaucrat, of a moderate, etc., etc. But then we really saw, you know, that... Uh, uh, that that the way he's he's leading the country is it's much more kind of ruthless and to the point. So uh, just reacting to some things that uh, Zrinka um, kind of brought mm -hmm. up earlier. So absolutely, you know, the corruption scandals of the Kadeze. I hinted at that. I couldn't go into it in 15 minutes. Thank you for doing so. Absolutely, you know, the uh, wind farm affair is just the latest in a in a long long series, which unfortunately we've seen that it didn't really quite move the needle so much until now so no. um yeah but but definitely you know that was an yet another thing that happened in this period from the announcement of the elections until now Mojum, absolutely you know thank you for speaking about them etc of course you know with, with what i mentioned earlier about the the new uh, and uh, the new way of doing politics as I was actually you know referring to to them specifically i didn't want to sound too partisan but uh, it is it is a quite inspiring way of doing politics and i do hope it uh, it sticks around also i would mention that they were instrumental in zagreb city to really you know yes. kind of keep a bandage on his toes so them uh, along with the um, filmmaker dario yurichan who ran as a spoof yes. candidate, the best <laughs> crazy the, the campaign best yes candidate ever uh, for the yes. presidential elections they really kind of uh, uh, yeah, took the the, the bail off uh, of bandage and and his uh, his uh, corruption to the bone has been exposed. So uh, so kudos to them. I would say though, you know that uh, uh, that it's uh, <laughs> a small criticism and kind of you know a way to 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 improve. Like I am voting in the, the Rijeka region, Primorsko Goranska Županija, and I mean on 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 the list of the candidates here for Mojmo, there's only one person who doesn't even have a Twitter account. You know, and the others are from Randish yeah. Front. They don't even have a bloody Twitter account. It's free, guys. You're candidate. You're, you're putting yourself forward as a candidate. Just try to use these networks at the very least. Yeah. So small criticism. I would also say their song is amazing. It's just so cool. Mm -hmm. Check it out if you didn't yet. It's uh, so it, it it is it is it is nice that new new options are springing up. Let's uh, let's mm -hmm. see how it plays out. In terms of the media, you know, I would say that uh, yes, there's a big problem with the media, and I would agree that. Uh, that the situation is the worst in the past 10 years, specifically yes, for 20. <laughs> yeah, but specifically yeah. for the public broadcaster, for higher tech. Yes, yes. The uh, huge uh, issue in Croatia is the slap suit. Yes, this is what, what I said. It was Sorry, absolute news. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Basically, um, you know, uh, this is this is like the, the huge issue. On the other hand, I would say that it's also encouraging that some web portals are springing up of course again not a massive reach with the electorate at, at large but you know kind of making inroads with the younger population you know telegram certain point extent index etc etc so they these guys these small outlets have managed to in 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 really impossible situations to unearth such a big amount of crazy you know corruption scandals this is remarkable. It's really really Don't forget Natya now. We started all, the all these things. Yes. <laughs> no, not I not think not. that we were that credit Sorry, goes for us question. for many affairs. Yes. yes not you now. Definitely. No, not yeah. has been has been instrumental in many things, also in the energy and Karamarkovo, etc. etc. But yeah. I do have a question for you, Zrink, in that respect. So we've seen like Index has covered it, that you know there was a secret uh, uh, meeting uh, between Plankovic and the uh, editors in chief of uh, most of the media in Croatia, so it's not only national, but I mean, the national editor in chief was present at that meeting, at which it seems that it was discussed, you know, how to cover the coronavirus crisis in a favorable way. So I wanted to ask, you know, since you're there, can you tell us a bit more what was discussed at that meeting and what's the fuss all about? 
I'm not editor in chief. I was editor in chief of of Radio One Hundred One. I'm yeah. I'm here just a journalist and and a columnist. I wasn't there, but um, actually the way we covered this crisis, uh, I think it was very transparent. So when it when it was important not to spread panic. I think we did our job, but on the other hand, we started to criticize this so-called uh, national crisis committee, led by uh, the minister of interior and um, the minister of health and uh, epi epidemiologists, because we thought that in the first month they did a great job, and later on they started to be politically instrumentalized, and now they are politically abused for this uh, for for election purposes mm -hmm. so the moment they started to be politically abused we started to criticize so don't worry about us we were not spreading panic no, no, I know, but, but at the same time at mm -hmm. the same time we started to criticize uh, the moment that hdz started to abuse epidem epidemiologists and medical professionals for their own purposes and we are terribly sorry that those people who are very good in their professions, actually <laughs> let them do it, uh, accepted that roles. Uh, I'm sorry for that because we really, they, they uh, their credibility among the uh, general public was very high and people really trusted them. If you look at the rates, as you said, in, in uh, uh, March, April, beginning of May, people really trusted them. And then when the campaign, pre-campaign started, we realized that actually they were abused by the ruling party. And unluckily, most of the members of this committee are the members of the ruling party. Like there are no doctors in social democrats or liberals or wherever. All the doctors come from the ruling party, unfortunately. That is very interesting because um, 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 as well as uh, like in Serbia, there is a pattern. So this mediocrity, um, um, ruling and this nepotism, um, which is like um, actually infecting the whole society. Is this problem um, as prevalent as it is in Serbia, for example, in Croatia? Is it, um, is it also only possible to get some certain jobs only if you are uh, a member of the ruling party, like having Absolutely. the... Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. This is the reason why they become a member. Mm. Look, Karlo Ressler, who was... Uh, who is, uh, well, we, we didn't talk about Croatian presidency over the EU because it was almost invisible. Although mm -hmm. Blankovic counted on that as one of, of his uh, credits for, for the elections, but it was coronavirus crisis and Croatian presidency was uh, completely invisible. But, you know, Carlo Ressler is one of the examples. He became member when he was very young and then he was leading the list for the European Parliament. and. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he, this guy has any ideals or that he believes in any kind of politics. His only ambition was to get some, well, to become a member of the European Parliament. If you want to get a job, yes, and you're 25, you will join the HDZ mm. or HNS or some okay. other party. Social yeah. Democrats are not so good in that because although everybody are accusing both parties that they're both guilty, for the situation that Croatia is in right now, 25 years after our independence. Well, I have to remind that social democrats were in power only twice. Mm -hmm. They were not corrupted, they were just incapable. <laughs> so this is their sin. So, you know, that was the problem. They did not punish corruption during their terms. And now they have a very young president and his problem is that nobody believes that he's the real leader. But I would agree with what Tena said, that Lenkovic in this duel was so arrogant that mm -hmm. although Bernardic does not, we don't perceive him as a leader because he was not arrogant. He was much more modest. He, he came to the show with lots of papers and you know trying to search for some data for argument. I think that that people liked him more because Plankovic is so full of himself and he's a very good European bureaucrat. He's a diplomat. He's not a politician. And probably privately, he's anti-fascist, but at home he's doing everything to attract the, 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 the far right and those who are actually nationalistic and pro, pro and well, 
uh, ustasha nostalgic but let's to be let's put it in a modest way no yeah. nino so is this the, this is also driving people out of croatia then probably so um um, as far as we saw it, like either you have to become like a, a member of a party to get a certain job or something because it helps you in your career, or you say no, I don't want this. I leave the country all um, all the way. Um, is this like is this too simple or is this an accurate picture? It, it could be, yeah. But but we we can see, for example, from from the research also that has uh, made that. There are some trends that are changing, for example, for young people, of course. And also it depends like if you're working in public sector or, or if you're working in private sector or if you're working also in NGOs or civic, uh, civic sector. So it really depends. Yes, of course, this is also one of the reasons why young people are leaving the country, because there's still mm -hmm. a high level of corruption and nepotism. Uh, we can see, for example, that Transparency International still uh, put uh, Croatia like at the end uh, of the list of the European Union uh, when, when talking about the corruption because there there's for example if, if you see like uh, five years six years ago not, nothing not, nothing is changing actually uh, regarding this rank uh, but yeah, yeah, worse. Yeah. sorry yeah, we're worse. We, are, we became worse in the meantime <laughs> yeah I don't know like what what was the situation with Bulgaria now but actually like we are competing with Bulgaria and Romania all the time uh, regarding the corruption and nepotism okay. so and we are not moving from 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 this yeah unfortunately so uh but yeah, i think it, it depends uh, there are a few elements uh there are some trends that are changing that uh young people think uh that uh, uh, their capability is like the, the the most important thing and their skills are most most, most important thing while entering the the labor market and getting the jobs it's not like the uh, if you have some network, something like that. But actually, I think that while they're while they are searching for a job, or while they're entering, they feel that the reality is like a little bit different. You know, this is like what the what the research is when you're asking high schoolers and students. But actually, they are they are not working, so they they were not they they were not enter a labor market. They feel like what was the like reality there um, for getting the job. Uh, but uh, there are also some elements. I, ju I just want to refer on uh, on some elements why young people are leaving the country uh, from 2013. So it's really uh, a political situation. It's what we actually said, corruption and uh, like uh, value system that is still existing in uh, Croatia. Uh, there is also high rate of unemployment still for young people. It's, it's really a um, higher rate than uh, uh, general population. Uh, there's also what I have said, the uh, absence of uh, structural education uh, reform. Um, inability to find quality job, you really need to wait too long to, uh, to find the quality job uh, that is linked to your profession. So you have a lot of uh, uh, young people that are, for example, uh, they, they have, they, they graduate or something like that. But they are uh, working, you know, uh, during the season, uh, some low quality jobs, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, inadequate salary regarding uh, uh, their qualifications. So that are the reasons and also uh, uh, opinion that, uh, for example, uh, Western European countries uh, have uh, quality, um, quality life, uh, so better life than uh, and better life expectation than uh, in our region. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I have a very interesting uh, question from uh, the audience. I will just show it to you. Um, mm -hmm. And it comes from... Uh, mm -hmm. civic, civic education? Yes. Um, is politics uh, or civic education taught in schools and mm. um, how no. <laughs> the legacies of the homeland war addressed in school? What are the relations to the Croat Serbs in Croatia? So it wasn't also this very good question. Mm. Very good question. I'll just tell ten. I would probably say more, but this is something that we were mm. writing a lot about. Mm -hmm. uh, no, civic education was meant to become uh, a special subject, uh, a separate subject uh, in in a new curriculum uh, mm -hmm. during uh, the last government led by Zoran Milanovic. Uh, mm -hmm. Curriculum was, all, of course, uh, I, I mean, it was a subject of, me of many debates. And what we didn't mention, none of us, is mm -hmm. the role of Catholic Church, mm -hmm. which is very important. Mm -hmm. And they started their propaganda. They actually draw 
a party that believers and religious people should vote for. They didn't name it, but they said it. And they also intervened into all the attempts of uh, reform of educational system. So what, I'm, I'm not, okay, I respect them, but I can even understand why they didn't want to introduce so-called sexual education in schools because of some, their reasons. But what's wrong with civic education? I think that religious people too should know about their civic rights, about how how the state operates. It's not introduced, it's part of different subjects. It's so so-called interdisciplinary, and actually it depends on the goodwill of the teachers. There are two towns, Rijeka is one, and Sisak is the other, where I think it was uh, introduced as a subject, but you can take it voluntarily. It's not obligatory. Mm -hmm. But there are two, and why? Because in Sisak and in Rijeka, mayors come from Social Democratic Party. When it comes to uh, Croatian Serbs, yes, we had explosions of nationalism, of uh, hate speech, of graffiti, everything. It was just uh, something that we expected before the elections. And of course that uh, Mr. Pupovac, who is the leader of Croatian Serbian parliamentary party is always guilty for everything. And he even made a, a, a promotion TV advert saying, yes, I'm guilty for everything now. <laughs> you know, you can accuse me. It was, it was a good one, yes. <laughs> Ah, yeah, I saw it. It was with this. Yeah, um, it was a good one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In the end, there yeah. was this combination of his letters yeah. and it comes Blame out. Blame me. It's me. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, even that the, 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 the sum of his, um, the, the letters of his uh, name uh, combined is Ch, which stands for Chetnik. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very good. Blur, yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm guilty because all the, the Croatian yeah. youngsters are going to Belgrade to listen to this horrible folk music. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm to blame for it. Yeah. It was good. And yeah. that he was uh, spreading coronavirus. Yes, by the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a good one. Um, yeah, um, what, yeah, what is I can, your Yeah. Sure, yeah. I can react on, uh, on some mm. of this. So thank you for covering the, the part about the civic education, a very important point indeed, and there were many controversies about education in general in Croatia, so that it, that is an important point still unsolved, like there is no way, proper way to tackle uh, these issues in the upbringing of, uh, of youngsters, it's, uh, it's super important. Um, I wanted to react to Edhard's question about the role of Europe, Balkans and foreign politics in the campaign, which uh, is true, we, we haven't touched upon so far. So, um, just a um, moment. I will. Yes. I would like this to to show the the question uh, to course. the public. Yeah. yeah. Just that. I'm sorry for interrupting. Just that no. the audience is informed. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so it's a. Uh, it's a good point, but um, you know, basically, it wasn't it wasn't dominant. Uh, but okay, let me go into it. So, uh, my opinion is that uh, it is that actually um, Croatian public opinion as a whole is uh, is not like your skepticism does not play a big role. I mean, uh, these are questions that Western political scientists have been asking over and over again. Like, which oh. part of your skeptics, which one is not? My opinion is that they are your skeptic only insofar as it serves their immediate political goals. It's more a practical way of being Eurosceptic rather than like some sort of value base or something. And I'll explain. So basically the mainstream in, um, uh, in, in Croatia is uh, um, sort of, you know, unitarily pro-EU, um, pro the EU um, sort of path of, the, of, of Croatia, especially like uh, is, uh, is this is clear clearer and clearer, you know, they're really the lap dog of the EPP, of the, you know, uh, right-wing mm -hmm. group in the European Parliament in, um, in the country. I mean, they really do, you know, fall in line with whatever they say. They did dare not, uh, for instance, you know, criticize Orban, whereas a lot of other countries did. This is also partially due to the complicated issues in energy in Croatia. But in general, like, you know, whatever uh, the the EPP's line is this is carried out by the Hadeze very very strongly in um, in in Croatia, and this is you know the fact that the the Hadeze especially uh, but the mainstream in general is perceived as being very much you know 
in line with the EU and uh, uh, kind of uh, in line with uh, the um, you know big capital and these um, mm, this kind of uh, neoliberal you know maybe um, uh, issues uh, it it has opened you know kind of a political um, topic for other countries to exploit and to challenge the ma mainstream yeah. on that. So once mm -hmm. upon a time there was this GVZ, you know, that made a bit of uh, headlines with that. Now also Most has some Eurosceptic views, of course, you know, Skorov on this hand. But I mean, if you watch the debate yesterday, you know, they all rally against uh, stuff that the EU has done and the mm -hmm. way new funds are implemented in Croatia and stuff like that. But they all want the EU's money at the mm -hmm. end. You know, none of them is saying we need to get out of the EU. They're all saying we want the EU's money. Uh, but like the EU is bad for these reasons. And I mean, in my opinion, you know, in my analysis, it's more like a way of carving for themselves a niche and exploiting some grievances politically, rather than something that is very, very strongly eradicated in the, in the, um, um, in the, you know, in the population, something that is very strongly uh, felt as, as a value. I would also mention a certain, you know, hypocrisy of the Hadeze on that front of being very anti-EU and, you know, nominally, Un, uh, sorry, pro-EU and nominally kind of anti-Russia because Russia is kind of, uh, uh, you know, the pattern of Serbia in the very simplistic uh, uh, type of explanation. Because also, again, you know, when you look slightly beyond beneath the surface, uh, I mean, some of the links that Nacional has exposed, you know, between Karamarko and uh, Russians in energy, or for instance, the PPD, you know, this uh, yeah. this incredible, this company that made the biggest, it, it has the highest growth in the whole of Croatia, this private company. That has no, no, just sorry to interrupt. They are behind this homeland movement. They are right. financing the homeland movement. So it's the same. It's the same group. It's the same pattern. Before yes. they financed Kadeze, now they finance the the other five right. So you see, you know, this huge hypocrisy of the the right wing in Croatia in theory being, uh, you know, anti Russia, anti what is East, anti Serbs, anti Russia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and in fact getting the money because of course you know the game of Russia is as usual as always kind of uh, uh, divide and conquer you know like it sort of it, it goes on both ways they also it ha they have been I think there are links between you know them and Ivan Perner for instance which was another hand so that's as far as the EU is concerned in terms of the Balkans so the Balkans uh, have been a bit of a topic uh, because of the uh, EU uh, sorry the first uh, presidency of the EU council that Croatia has held uh, from uh, from January to June this year, and uh, like sort of the clue moment of this presidency was supposed to be the Zagreb summit in May, uh, which did know, not which, happen. <laughs> yes. Which happened only virtually, yes. yes. So the fact that it happened virtually was like the only positive thing. But you know, in fact, like the wins were were achieved beforehand. The fact that North Macedonia and Albania finally got the uh, the green light to enter uh, and uh, to start accession negotiations that was uh, agreed beforehand it was a long path until then and there weren't really big inroads you know big big, uh, big headlines in that respect so it was a bit of a whimper once again i would say for you know the Hadeze's uh, policy of making out of this eu presidency big success I mean, I'm sorry to say, because in a way, it's, I would say they did put a lot of effort in, you know, creating capacity for this to happen. But then, for various reasons, it, it wasn't so such a big thing. And I mean, in terms of the Serbian minority, you know, Zrinka has already replied to you. And luckily, there are, there are a lot of incidents. And again, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, all, it's really much of it is to do with political manipulation, rather than something that is really felt among the the population but uh, but there are it's undeniable it's still something we need to you know to deal with in croatia mm. yeah um for i would like to ask um uh, nino how's um, um xenophobic your uh, um, anti-minority sentiment around uh, young people in croatia is there is this like something that is uh, more isolated to to football hooliganism and so on or is this something that is maybe uh, widespread. Actually, it is not. It, it is still uh, uh, present, you know, also within the young population. For example, we can also see the trends from 2015 up at me with the, with, with the research. Um, uh, we also one longer uh, organization that made the research with uh, Institute, Institute for Social uh, Research. When we have uh, when we see the trends that young people. Uh, actually, 40 and something percent of young people 
are going towards uh, uh, right center, you know, this, this kind of opinion and towards the xenophobic uh, attitude. So uh, I'm not sure if we have like decreasing trends now regarding that, but we have we had also some kind of incidents also in the, in the southern part of uh, Croatia, but actually in Zagreb with uh, um, uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, with hooligans, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, we, we had some incidents. So we cannot say, but actually we have this on the we, we have this opposite uh, also groups who are tackling those kind of issues and who are fighting and protesting uh, those kind of uh, xenophobic um, incidents. Mm -hmm. This is quite yeah. alarming. Actually. Yeah. It is. <laughs> uh, I just um, want can I can I add some uh, because I know that Mr. Busek has been helping us with media situation for more than 20 years. And um, just to prove the connections between, I mean, they always claim it's a public media service, which of course is not. It's the state controlled, party controlled television. And just, you know, to give you two examples, uh, editor of, the, of the, the biggest part of morning and afternoon programs, is the mother of the spokesman of the government. The editor of all the news programs on radio and television is the, is the wife of the chief of secret services in Zagreb. And they call ministers to ask them what to do. Croatian uh, uh, television journalists are forbidden from asking questions, nasty questions to the ruling party most of them are prevented from work so they receive their salaries but they cannot work so there are hundreds of people just walking around they cannot fire them because you know it's against the, the law they still need them but instead of that they hire some people from somewhere else who do whatever the ruling party wants and nobody is criticizing the situation like, and it's the same like, like with Hungary. Why? Because Croatia is the member of the European Union. If we were not the member of the European Union, there would be monitoring. Somebody would tell us, would warn us, don't do that. I know, and this is the reason why influence of Croatian public television is diminishing and why, for example, the president did not, did want, did not want to go to debate to the public television and why the leader of the opposition refused to contribute in the, this pre-election pre debate on public television because he was invited by the, the prime minister. He was not invited by editor-in-chief of Croatian television, by by the prime minister. And he said, are you editor-in-chief of, of public television? Why don't they invite me? In this case, if you invite me, I refuse to go. So this is the situation. I think that since the, the, the time we became the member of the European Union, human rights situation and media situation is just going backwards and nobody cares because we are a member. Because all the, all the leverage the European Union has um, is diminishing when a country becomes a member, unfortunately. Yes. yes. So, um, and I, I just want to add because, um, for example, I was also um, um, having a look on how is, um, is there any media coverage uh, like for in other countries of the European Union about the situation in Croatia? And um, I almost found nothing um, speaking about media and media freedom in Croatia, um, except one small podcast by the German Deutschlandfunk from a journalist um, who was in uh, exchange uh, for half in a year uh, in HRT and what she described there was um, Unimaginable, really, seriously, yes. <laughs> to say the least. But no one hears about that in the European no. Union. It's not a topic. Yeah. Um, so we are like very, uh, uh, um, very, um, let's say, um, in a some minutes coming to an end with our event. Um, and But I want to take um, the chance and uh, uh, to ask you what is for you um, the future, what are for you the future developments and 
um, how is the outlook on the future for Croatia after this elections? Um, maybe I would start again with um, mm -hmm. um, with Tena to to tell us her view or her expectations, her maybe also what she's afraid of, what could happen. And, yeah, I am afraid of uh, I'm afraid of Gilead, you know, taking over Croatia. <laughs> that that would be very scary, um, and it's an option to be honest. I mean, uh, yeah, as we as we see, you know, this uh, far right coalition is uh, in terms of numbers, it's uh, it's possible. So that is something that uh, that could happen, and that it's quite uh, quite scary. Um, I mean, I, you know, I already said that I. I it will be it will be very interesting what what we what happens after the elections um, and um, it will be interesting to see also uh, once again you know the number of the people who switch uh, switch uh, um, switch teams at that point uh, as we know this is uh, this is quite a tradition in Croatia like the which has been perfected by the mayor of Zagreb Milan Bandic who managed to get like I think 11, if I'm not mistaken, or even more, uh, you know, and well, uh, well yeah. there you go from one side to the other. So it will be interesting to see how things play out later. I think there will be quite a lot of political drama. And I don't think that, you know, that we could exclude completely some some options. I mean, and luckily, I don't see the numbers for, uh, you know, for, for something more sane than a far right. Uh, I mean, you know, for something on the on the left, I don't as as for now, you, you I can't see how it could happen, but uh, but let's see. I mean, you know, in, in Portugal it did happen, so so who knows? Uh, in Spain, to a certain extent. Um, on the other hand, again, you know, I think we should uh, we should keep our eyes peeled for the potential of a grand coalition, but also like how long will it last? You know. So one question is, what will the government that comes out of this? And the second one is, how long will this government uh, actually be be sustainable? Maybe we'll see some further development soon. You know, going further down the line and the last thing you know just to try to end on a positive note uh, at least this sunday in croatia i think everybody has uh, you know somebody to vote for meaning you know at mm. least uh, there are there is a, a wide range of, of parties running and at least the outcome is not uh, decided in advance as we've seen in some neighboring countries wing wing serbia yeah mm. yeah um Drinka, um what is your what is your prognosis let's say and um what is um what would happen like in the best case scenario and what is maybe the worst case scenario up to your opinion it's very hard to say it's as tena said and i think uh, I, i'm very much afraid of the turnout because it's summer young people are not interested old people are afraid uh, people in institutions wouldn't be able to vote. So it turned out probably by some, well, I would like to be uh, pleasantly surprised, but by some analysis, it would be much less than 50%. In mm -hmm. that case, uh, the right wing parties always uh, win. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I don't believe in big coalition of social democrats and HDZ unless we had to repeat the elections. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, David Bernadic would not survive as a leader of social democrats if he accepts this, accept this great coalition immediately. Mm -hmm. And yes, there is a po the greatest possibility is of this huge coalition with the far right. But if they insist on their condition that uh, Andrei Plenkovic shouldn't be a prime minister, and this was one of their conditions. We will go into coalition, but we don't want Andrei Plenković as a prime minister. In that case, there would be no coalition. In that case, we would have new elections. So I don't know. What I know is that we have no tourist season, that Croatia did not get out from the latest recession. We are, we are just running into new recession and economic crisis. We, knew, uh, we need a new stable government and I'm not sure that we will have it by the end of this year. I'm not very op optimistic. And of course, I mean, there was no campaign for people to vote, like the one that we spoke about uh, for Alexander Vucic, who is a dictator, but he has a very creative team. And his advert to yeah. invite people to vote was remarkable. It's genius. Mm. Nobody made such a thing in Croatia. Mm. So I'm not optimistic. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, and Nino, how's um, from your for your from your point of view, what is um, what uh, is the few future up to bring after the elections for Croatia and uh, Croatian EU, for example? Yeah. So usually I'm a really optimistic person, mm -hmm. but actually when I saw the results of uh, this pre-election service. I, I cannot say that uh, we will have the change of uh, the government. Maybe some, some things will change regarding the coalition. But actually, if, if you saw the, the results of a pre-election uh, service, we can see that the uh, re um, relative uh, winner will be a uh, restart coalition. But actually, they don't have this quality and um, a really strong uh, potential uh, for coalition with uh, other uh, center uh, left or uh, green left uh, wing parties. So if we still have this government that, that is still now, uh, and if they will continue with their work like uh, they did in uh, in previous uh, minutes uh, and regarding the young people, we cannot say that we will have uh, the change because uh, actually when we made the analyze uh, how they are approaching to towards young people's problems and towards uh, young people in general, it was, I don't know if you know this uh, uh, Roger Hart's letter. Um, so it's, uh, there, there are like eight, uh, eight ranks uh, of uh, involving the young people uh, for political participation. Here, for example, if you say that uh, number eight is like the highest level of participation of young people, in Croatia now we have uh, number three, so it's tokenism. So it's, mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, putting young people in front of you just, just to, you know, show them, but actually not giving them uh, like the opportunity to actually uh, make some the decisions or give the ideas for making the changes or uh, involving them in uh, creating the, the policy measures or actually public policies. So, um, yeah, I'm not optimistic about that, but actually I hope that we will have the opportunity as a creation youth network, the, um, so the National uh, Youth Council, uh, and our role is like to advocate for uh, quality youth policies and quality youth programs, and I hope that we will have the opportunity to, to make some impact on the government. Actually, as the, as the member of the European Union, we really need to involve more those kind of platforms uh, that, that are representing not just young people, but also youth and for youth organizations, uh, and to really make some changes, because actually what what we have uh, is a team that is really making analyses, you know, it, and uh, is tracking, you know, all the policy measures regarding the young people. So we have know-how here, but actually we also need this moment of uh, someone, uh, that, that someone is uh, hearing what we are saying, you know. So, yeah, I hope that we will have this opportunity after the elections, uh, even if we, we will have this government that didn't have, you know, the, the will to, to do that. Still now. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely see your point. I mean, the, this um, distorted media situation also doesn't make it easier for you, yeah. let's say. Yeah. Um, Actually, if I can just add one thing is that if you if you see media coverage and you know the like the uh, representing young uh, young people in media is like blaming them uh, for expansion of COVID. Uh, I don't know if you, if you saw this, like young people are, you know, uh, it's their fault uh, that we have now the spreading uh, coronavirus again. So it's not like a uh, really a good situation for young people also in the media. So <laughs> okay. we, we hope for more affirmative, you know, approach of media also for, for young people. It will motivate them to maybe to engage more, you know, in, in political processes or any kind of other processes. Of course, I see. Yes, I would like to thank you very much. This was a very enlightening uh, uh, discussion. And um, it just shows that um, uh, some things always or most often uh, stay the same, even though uh, the name of the party changes, which is very, I think, um, an observable uh, phenomenon when it comes to when it comes to uh, Southeastern Europe, unfortunately. Yeah. So there is still a lot of political work to be done. So thank you very much, um, Lorenzian, who uh, had his introduction. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, for your contributions. Um, this were like really, really, really good insights, really uh, enlightening. Um, and I hope you soon, to see you soon. Um, 
at the IDM and you for the audience. Thank you uh, very much uh, for, for joining us and showing interest into this um, online event. And um, I just want to remember uh, again that there will be another online panel discussion on the elections in Northern Macedonia. Macedonia. Which is Macedonia. Great. Thank, thank you very everybody. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.